I don't like this. What do you mean? Oi! Mackenzie! Yeah, come here! So, we'll leave you to it then, alright? Okay. Let's go. Don't forget to look at him in the mouth! <laughs> Mackenzie! Sergeant? What are you doing? Aiming drill, Sergeant. Aiming drill. Aren't you supposed to be with your company right now? Well, well, y yes. Then what are you doing here? Well, the, the Rosses asked me to just finish setting this up and- Rosses? Well, Never heard of them. Sounds to me, Mackenzie, as though somebody's doing a little bit of skiving. Me, Sergeant? No, no, no! Yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds to me, Mackenzie, as though you need to set your sights on something else. Something a little more nourishing, perhaps. I, I, I don't understand. Well, Mackenzie, can you hit the first class target? Usually. What about the figure target? Yes. What about the spud target? Spud target? Well, surely, Mackenzie, you can hit this, can't you? <laughs> Leading on from part one of preliminary training, in this video, we'll cover position drill and judging distance, as well as some other more minor aspects of musketry training. The references are as discussed previously. The musketry regulations from 1874, 79, 84, and 87, which were reprinted in 1889. For the infantry, there were generally three positions from which to fire. The standing, the kneeling, and the prone position, known in the era as the lying position. The sitting position was used, although primarily in the cavalry, as kneeling with spurs on could be quite taxing on the posterior. These positions were practiced in a series of movements known as position drill. This might be better described as the repetition of separate movements associated with the adoption of the various fire positions. This was a separate and distinct set of evolutions apart from the firing exercise, which was focused on the effective result of collective firing, whilst position drill focused more on individual fundamentals. In order for the men to have something to aim at as they performed the drills, a series of aiming marks were placed on the barrack wall. Based on commonly found shapes, they were painted at 3 foot and 18 inches off the ground. Here, although taken later in the magazine rifle era, we can see the position drill aiming marks painted on the wall behind the men. In order to protect the moving parts from any undue shock, a snap cap was used for instances when dry firing or snapping was called for. It was a small device made of brass and iron with an internal spring and an ebonite insert in the base in place of a primer. Roughly the shape and dimension of the wide part of a case, it gave the firing pin something to strike. In order to facilitate its repeated use in the rifle without having to constantly extract and reload it, opposing sides of the rim were removed. While I don't have an example of the issue snap cap, I have made one from a damaged case. This has had a piece of old eraser from a pencil jammed into the primer pocket to provide the firing pin something to land on. In addition, opposing sides of the rim have been ground off. Shown here, when inserted with the rim horizontal, the snap cap could be withdrawn and reloaded in the conventional fashion. And when it was inserted with the rim vertical, the action could be opened and closed, with the snap cap remaining chambered for greater efficiency in the repetition of training evolutions. In this instance, it was withdrawn with the use of the cleaning rod. Thus, with the snap cap inserted, position drill, of which there were three practices, could commence. Position drill by numbers. First practice, standing at 300 yards ready. The first focused on the correct placement of the butt of the rifle in the shoulder. Practiced from very early on in the Victorian era, 
and continuing into the Martini era. Present. The salient aspect to the first practice was the exaggerated extension of the left arm to the front, thereby positioning the rifle well in front of the shoulder. Here, from a different angle. Two. In the second part, the rifle was drawn into the shoulder. Three. And in the third, returned to the ready position. The second practice built upon the first. Second practice, standing at 300 yards ready. Present. And incorporated the taking of correct aim. Two. As well as dry firing the action. Three. The same procedure was conducted in the kneeling position observing the same principles. Present. Two. Three. In taking aim, the men were instructed to align the sights below the target, and then raise the rifle up, bringing the sights into alignment. The trigger was pressed when the sights bore. The third practice was a combination of the previous movements, done in repetitious fashion, mimicking the procedure for independent firing. Third practice, standing. Independent firing at 300 yards, ready. Note the logical progression from the drill being executed by numbers to now being a fluid motion, with repeated snaps made. Commence. Cease fire. The third practice was also conducted in the kneeling position. Commence. And the lying position. Commence. In adopting the lying position, the feet were to be crossed, although later in the era, this was augmented with an option to lay the feet apart. The three position drill practices habitually conditioned the men to take up the appropriate positions, observing the fine details that made for good shooting. One other position that bears mention was the supine position. Although not an official military position in this era, in that it wasn't taught during the firing exercise or indeed position drill, its use was widespread in competitive target shooting activities as an alternative to the unsupported prone or lying position. This position allowed for the rifle to be rested on either the feet or the legs for more stability. It would be included in the manuals moving into the 1890s, although there as well as earlier in the era, it wasn't prescribed as a position to be practiced at during drill. Now those with even a passing awareness of the rifle will probably be aware of the presence of this small oval indentation on the upper right rear corner of the action body. Most will point to it being intended to give a place to put the thumb when shooting so that the overly large small of the rifle, derived from its humpback profile, will not cause the thumb to hit the nose when shooting. As we shall see, the truth is rather less specific. It might be interesting to know that it's only mentioned once in the official military manuals, and that is in relation to the evolution of easing springs after either unloading or ejecting an empty case, after which there is no intention to continue shooting. There's ample photographic evidence to suggest that the use of the thumb seat was not as widespread or universal as might otherwise be thought. Now, what the manual does say is to grip the small of the butt with the thumb pointed towards the muzzle. While it prescribes the general arrangement of the hand, the thumb seat in particular is not mentioned. Now, this thumb placement can be traced back to the 1840s and 50s using similar wording, and it would seem that the thought was so that with the thumb so placed, it could better operate in conjunction with the forefinger to achieve an equal and steady pressure on the trigger, much like the action of both during the easing of springs previously shown. Here in this photograph of instructors at Hive demonstrating the platoon, or firing exercise, circa 1859, we can plainly see the thumb placed on the small rather than around it. In doing so, the thumb points towards the muzzle. There is other evidence of this practice as shown here. So while the thumb seat isn't mentioned specifically, it would seem to indicate that the thumb was placed on the small, near the breech nail of earlier rifles. 
and in and around the area of the thumb seat on the Martini Henry. There certainly is photographic evidence of this practice. But there is a considerable body of this evidence which would seem to point to an alternative, that the thumb could be placed equally wrapped around the small, as is shown in these photographs. This would seem to indicate a rather looser interpretation of the thumb placement when firing a martini. So what does this all mean? Firstly, by virtue of the identical language used in the manual stretching back to the 1850s, it would point to a much more pervasive technique, common across many different types of weapons and eras, and not something specific to the martini, with a view to mitigating any kind of thumb-into-cheek issues experienced while firing. Secondly, modern shooters, even historical ones, should be able to use with a certain degree of confidence any and all variations of thumb placement, including on the thumb seat, near the thumb seat, and around the small, secure in the knowledge that this flexibility existed during the era. Judging distance was a critical skill and had been a major component of musketry training since its introduction in the 1850s. Despite the fact that the Martini had a much flatter trajectory than either the Enfield or the Snyder, it still did not have the flat trajectories associated with rifles today. Thus, accurate estimation of range was of paramount importance past the point-blank range of the rifle, which was discussed in the introduction video to this series. The skill was initially based on the estimation of ranges according to the appearance of men at various ranges from 200 to 800 yards, but later judging distance by sound perhaps by the use of a loud bang or even a gunshot, was introduced. Judging distance drill was the process by which the men were trained. Judging distance practice was the procedure used to assess the man's ability. Men were expected not only to judge distance to a man or men or even groups of men, but also to objects such as trees, hedges, buildings and such. Men were awarded points as to the accuracy they were able to attain over the given ranges. There will be more information on this specific evolution as the series progresses. Included here as a point of interest, the use of the stadiometer provided the capability to accurately measure the distance to a given person or point using the relationship of angles and distance. Once all of these preliminary skills and theories were taught, the men were practiced at firing blanks. Now I'm not going to bore you with making loud noises and clouds of smoke without the benefit of actual terminal effect. But suffice it to say, 40 rounds were used in recruit training to accustom the men to the noise, smoke, and to a lesser extent the recoil of the rifle. They were expended in a mixture of individual firing and collective firing, both in volleys and independent firing. While unfortunately not available to shoot for the production of this video, there still needs to be mention made of what was known as the Morris Tube. Patented in 1881 and entering service from after 1883, the Morris tube was the first attempt at providing the ability to shoot sub-caliber ammunition from the Martini Henry. It was essentially a purpose-designed barrel that fit inside the 45 caliber barrel of the Martini Henry and with its peculiar breech adapter allowed for the firing of the .23 Morris round. This could roughly be compared to a modern 22 rimfire round but the Morris round featured a bottleneck case and a centerfire primer. There were a set of auxiliary sights that came with the kit that would allow for the considerably different ballistics of the smaller round. Although introduced into service from 1883, the first manual to make mention of this device was the 1887 musketry regulation. There were found details of the method of fitting as well as rudimentary guides to how they were to be used for musketry practice one could generally equate the concept that was applied to the aforementioned blank firing evolutions in that the rounds were to be expended in basic individual firing, which included practice in the various fire positions already mentioned. As you can tell, this device came into service very late in our era, but it would continue to be used well into the 303 era with a version specific to those rifles and would augment the range of the 22 caliber based training rifles that would enter service in the early 20th century. With this program complete, the men were then ready to progress to the range and begin the next phase of training, target practice. While this is the subject of subsequent videos, 
This was the shooting component of the men's annual musketry course and was undertaken from 150 to 800 yards by trained men. This raises an interesting point that might tie all this training into the proper context. The total time spent in preliminary training by recruits, as alluded to at the beginning of this video, was some eight days, with a further ten on the range. For trained men already posted to their battalions, there were only two days of preliminary training to refresh their knowledge in aiming drill, position drill, judging distance, theoretical principles, and care and cleaning, with a further 11 days spent on the range. Bear in mind that this period covers a number of years, and as well as a number of iterations of the musketry regulation. There were some necessary changes and improvements undertaken throughout the era, and therefore some of the exact figures and numbers must be taken as more exemplary rather than directly applicable to the whole era. So this brings us to the end of the examination of the preliminary training during the era of the Martini Henry. Hopefully it has served to better acquaint the viewer as to the degree of knowledge expected of the soldier of the 1870s and 80s. As the army served across the globe, the infantry battalions carried with them these skills and drills. And at least to me, it paints a much more complete picture of the Tommy that stood at the rocky ridge at Islandwana, in the square at Tofrek, or launched himself at the enemy in the final red-coated battle at Ganis. The same could be said too, admittedly though, perhaps in some form of abridged version depending on the location and type of forces employed, of the training that was promulgated across the empire and practiced by the forces of Canada, India, Australia and elsewhere. In the next video in this series, we'll examine the annual qualification of 1879 with the shooting of the individual practices. These were the standard classification practices upon which was based the man's status as a marksman, first or second class shot. I'd like to thank Neil Aspinshaw of the Martini Henry Society and author of the book The Martini Henry for Queen and Empire for particular help in the production of this series. Not only is his book perhaps the best reference on the subject, but his kind assistance in sourcing a set of auxiliary sites to show you the viewer was of particular note. There is a review of his book here on the channel. And to David at Research Press for providing a couple of the photographs used in the production of this series. It's a great reference for 19th century shooting information. And to friend of the channel, Toby, who also kindly provided some photographs. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.